So I, I want to start off just by asking, how many people uh, are here for the first time at any Rust conference? Holy cow! <laughs> That's awesome. Um, welcome. Uh, so we're going to be talking a bunch about community throughout, but I, I think for me, the greatest source of joy in Rust is its community. Uh, so I'm really glad you're here, and I hope you know you get to meet some of the existing Rust community and, and sort of feed off of the, the joy and excitement that is Rust. Um, okay, so that said, uh, let's get started on the keynote. Um, so the, this keynote is going to sort of give a view of where we are in the 2017 cycle of Rust development. Um, so as you may or may not know, the way that uh, sort of Rust development is set out these days is at the beginning of each year, um, we put together a roadmap uh, of what we hope to accomplish that year. That's done through a community-driven RFC process. We all talk about that roadmap for a month or so before you know, finalizing it. And then that serves as uh, a sort of mission for the year that we continue to check up on uh, as time goes by. So uh, the mission we set out for 2017 um, has as its sort of most concise summary, making productivity a core value of Rust. Um, so that is, you know, as you may know, Rust gives you performance, it gives you reliability, um, but if it has one weakness, it's probably in the productivity front. How easy it is to learn, uh, how easy it is to find quality libraries that do what you, know, what you need, and so on. So we laid out a whole bunch of um, you know, uh, sort of sub items under this heading for how to make Rust a more productive language from, from a bunch of different angles. And I'm not gonna go through all of these right now. The rest of the talk is, is gonna basically delve into each of these angles and where we are, what we're doing. So that said, uh, we are, um, you know, several months uh, <laughs> into the year. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> uh, and uh, so, you know, those of you who, who have been following, uh, you know, might like to know how are we actually progressing toward these, this, these goals and what is, how is the sort of flow of the year gone overall. Um, so I wanna, before we get into the specifics, I wanna give you another piece of the overall structure um, of how we've approached the year. So in particular, we, a lot of the things we wanted to do this year involved um, deep design work. Uh, so we wanted to find ways to make the language easier to learn by actually changing the language. And that's very hard and it requires, cha change to existing things is something that is often very contentious. Um, and so we had a long, you know, design focus period on at least some parts of the roadmap. Um, but uh, we're now in what, what we were calling the impl period, uh, which is, you know, basically no new design. We're focused on just executing on our plans and we're about a third of the way um, through this impl period. Uh, so let's see. So uh, I see, I should have done these slides there. Okay, so the idea is, yeah, throughout the year we've been doing sort of a mix of design and implementation now we're totally implementation focused. So one of the really cool things about how we've set up this impl period um, is it's been very geared toward uh, sort of community participation at all levels. So once we had a clear picture of you know, what we were trying to do, we organized that into 35 working groups. Um, and this seems like I, this is an incredible number <laughs> of, of groups doing things, um, but actually relatively few of these are led by the same person. So this is just, gives you a sense of how much activity there is in the Rust community um, actually attacking this roadmap. So each of these uh, working groups you know, has a designated leader, it has a dedicated um, chat channel on, on Gitter, and the leaders have put a lot of work into making these groups accessible. So even if you are brand new to Rust, uh, there, there's a place for you here you have skills that Rust needs. Um, and so I really encourage you to get involved in the impl period, it's been a lot of fun. And we'll, we'll again be seeing some of the results a bit later in, in the talk. Um, so one other thing about sort of the overall structure of the year and our plans. Uh, so you may have heard about this idea of epochs. And I, I just wanna sort of give the core team's perspective on, on what epochs are. Um, 
So let me, let me start by saying, you know, you probably know that Rust has um, a rapid release cycle. So every six weeks, we put out a new version of Rust, um, which is backwards compatible with all existing versions of Rust. And I think this release cycle has served us really well. It means we're sort of always incrementally improving the language. We, we don't have these big jumps or um, uh, high stakes releases. But <clears throat> there is, there are some downsides to that approach because if you're not following Rust super closely, it can be hard to understand what this evolution is about, right? You're seeing all these, like from, from a distance you see, okay, 10 new versions of Rust have happened. Like, how do I understand that? What does that mean to me? What version should I be using? Um, so what we're trying to do with Epochs is to sort of layer um, a story on top of those rapid releases. And so, so that every two to three years, we have an uh, epoch release, which basically says, okay, we've done a ton of work, and now we're, we're sort of choosing a synchronization point where everything's gonna come together. All the documentation is going to reflect all of the changes we've been making. All of the tooling is gonna work in a high quality way. Um, and here is the story of what this epoch is about. Uh, and so it's sort of a periodic way of actually putting together a polished, coherent story um, for Rust's evolution. Um, so our, our plan, you know, this isn't completely um, set in stone, but we're, we're imagining next year uh, releasing Rust model 2019, uh, uh, probably toward, toward the end of the year. And, you know, if you think about all these changes we'll, we'll be talking about to the language and so on, this is an opportunity to put all that together and again, synchronize it, make it coherent, and ship it to the world. Um, and, you know, as part of this, we, we will also have the ability to make some, uh, some tweaks that, uh, you know, involve uh, changes to existing code. So, like, if we want to introduce a new keyword, you might have been using that keyword as an identifier in previous code. Um, but we are very committed to making the upgrade process as smooth as possible. Uh, so this is an entirely opt-in thing and it's done crate by crate. So it's not gonna be like, you know, a Python 2 versus Python 3 style split. Um, at, we put a lot of thought into how to make this as smooth as our uh, incremental um, release cycle has been. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nico to start talking about the specifics. Hi everybody. Um, so I wanna talk about a lot of the language changes that we've been making or planning to make and the work we've been doing in the compiler to support those and also just to make the compiler nicer to use. Right? And one of the, the first, kind of if you go back to our roadmap goals, the one we're trying to attack here primarily is lowering Rust's learning curve. Um, but the way we decided to do that was not by, uh, we didn't wanna do things that would solely be targeted at new users because sometimes there's this this tendency to think that there's kind of a trade-off where you can make the language uh, easy for new users or you can make it kind of good for experienced users who know what they're doing, but if you increase one group, you hurt the other. But what we noticed is in fact that the things that new users hit and find hardest to learn are also the things that experienced users are hitting. They just learned how to deal with it and they can solve it, but it's still the same annoyances arising uh, in both cases, right? And so what we're shooting for is this, basically changes that improve the ergonomics of the language that make it as an experienced user, just reduce the friction you experience, the number of times you have to hit recompile because of small nitpicky errors or other things, the chance that the code you write will work good, uh, the first time you write it will compile well. And if we're, but that's, that same, the same changes really like uh, disproportionately benefit uh, new users as well. So let me walk you through some of them. And we're starting to see them land on nightly now. So uh, when we first gave this talk, or a version of this talk, uh, this was all of these slides were saying, well, we kind of have a design, you can give input on the design, but, but now we get to see some progress, right? So, so one example, in working with matches, so matches are one of the best features of Rust. You can deconstruct enums and find it, and make sure you handle all the cases you need to handle. But if you're working with matches over borrowed data, there's a lot of kind of small changes you have to make to make everything line up. So for example, if I match on a borrowed optional string, I have to put a star in front or that's one way to do it anyway, so that I'm now kind of dereferencing the reference and I'm matching on an option of string and then I put a ref to say, oh, and I'm borrowing the string outside of the option. Um, 
And this is something a lot of people, especially in the beginning, but even later on, find difficult to get right. right? And so what we've instead set up now is a system called default binding modes, where when you're matching on a reference, you don't have to write the star. We'll just go through the reference for you. And when we go through a reference, we know that you must be borrowing the content inside, right? So you get to write this snippet on the right. This lets you think more about the types. You just sort of know what the main types you have and that it's borrowed and less about exactly how is the compiler reasoning at this particular place um, and makes the overall experience smoother. And this is actually available on Nightly now. Uh, if you go and enable, you have to enable the feature gate, but I've been using it. It's very cool. Um, that's thanks to a contributor, by the way, to be a Schottdorf who implemented it. Uh, and another similar version, or similar in some sense, in the sense of reducing uh, repetitive content, is we've been working on this notion of implied bounds. So one thing you may have noticed if you've implemented generic types in Rust is that you often have a kind of core set of bounds that apply to your generic types. So you might say, I'm defining a set, and the things in the set can be any type T, but they have to be equatable and hashable. So like a hash set. And you put these bounds maybe on your type, and then you have to repeat them everywhere else, which is kind of annoying, right? So I usually just go and literally copy and paste it from place to place and then make sure I format it exactly the same so I can easily do it again when it changes. Um, and so we've been working on improving the compiler's reasoning system so that you just say the bounds once when you define the type, and then everywhere that you use it, they're implied by the fact that the type already said that it, they have to be there, right? So. This one has been accepted, not yet implemented. Um, turns out to be a little tricky. That's okay. We'll figure it out. So <laughs> uh, another example, um, a kind of hotly anticipated feature for some time now, is something called non-lexical lifetimes, which is a kind of opaque name. But what it basically means is you, it makes the, the borrowing system in Rust understand your control flow much better. Um, so right now, let's say I, I borrow from a map like I'm looking up in a hash map an entry for a given key and I'm, I'm borrowing the result. What will happen if I store the result of that borrow into a variable, like I did here, I said let value equals this variable, the borrow lasts until the end of the enclosing block, usually. Um, as a result, you know, you often have to sort of introduce artificial blocks so that you can end the borrow when you wanted it to end, right? So if you're just gonna use the value in the next line, for example, here, I just used it in the if, and I don't use it or in one branch of the if, and I don't use it again. That's not enough. I have to actually pull code out and, and insert blocks. Uh, and then I can make it compile. And these sort of contortions, this is a good example of something that becomes second nature when you're more experienced with Rust, but it's really not obvious if you're a newcomer, right? But nobody really wants to do it in the first place. So what we're doing in the new system is un having the compiler understand control flow much better, which means you can actually just write uh, code like this, which can look up the key in the map, use the value, and after the last use, when you stop using the thing that you took out of the map, it, it'll be free from mutation. The borrow is considered to end. Um, so this is something that's underway. Actually, Santiago, who's here in the audience, has been working with me and also Paul uh, Nashinas. I'm not sure of his last name, actually. Nashinas88. Uh, I know people by their IRC and Gitter nicknames, usually. but. Um, and we've been implementing it, and it's kind of working. You can't actually use it yet, but the, there are tests starting to pass, so this is on its way as well. Uh, there's also a much bigger effort, I should add, around uh, supporting this. A lot of people are involved. Um, and another similar thing in the sense of uh, a feature that enables, even, enables and eliminates roadblocks that everyone experienced and new users alike find extremely difficult to work around is something called Impultrate that lets you handle returning things like, if you'd like to return an iterator out of a function, that can be a little bit difficult right now because you have to specify the entire type of the iterator, which might be very long, or if it includes a closure, not even something you can type, right? Um, and so what we do now support in the compiler is the ability to say, I'm returning some type that implements iterator, in this case, an iterator that yields up I32s, I'm sorry, U32s, uh, and that means that even if it has closure types and so on, you don't have to actually tell it what the type is. The compiler will figure it out for you. Uh, so we have a preliminary version implemented. We're making a lot of improvements, though. Right now, you can only use it in return position in the current version of the compiler. But under the expanded and intended plans, we're going to be able to use it also in argument positions and other places to say, like, I'm taking some type that is an iterator uh, without having to introduce a generic argument and do these other things. Um, and Async await is another kind of feature like this. You may know it from languages like JavaScript or C Sharp. So if you're writing 
server-side code, you'd like to be able to do blocking I.O. operations, but you're, uh, you, or you'd like to be able to write code that looks like you're doing blocking I.O. operations, I should say, but actually when those I.O. operations are happening, your function returns and waits for the result and then starts over again. And you can do this by hand today, or you can use future combinators to do it, which sometimes works nicely, but a lot of times if the control flow is complicated, those solutions are kind of problematic. So we've been working on uh, enabling, com using kind of combination of compiler plugins and some built-in features, the ability to tag functions as async and then say, okay, I'd like to wait for the result of this I.O. operation, uh, and, and the compiler will transparently introduce all the plumbing that you need for you, right? And that's actually implemented and usable today if you download the right extensions. You should talk to Alex Crichton about it because I'm not sure what you have to set up exactly, but. Uh, so when you put it all together, I think you can start to get the feeling that Rust 2019 is going to feel like a pretty different language, right? And so I only talked about a few things. These are some of the proposals I talked about. The checks are the ones that are implemented, at least in some form. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff, and this isn't even a complete list, that has been, that we've been planning to do, um, most of which is in some form of, is in some way, part way through the implementation process. Someone is working on it. Uh, some of the ideas that we had didn't work out. You can see I, we crossed a few out. They didn't, they, they were too complicated to, or had other downsides. Um, but overall, I'm really excited to see what Rust 2019 is going to feel like, and I think you should be excited too. And if you want to help us, even though I said you can see there's progress there, there's still lots to do. So feel free to reach out to me on Gitter. I will find you something. I will put you to work. Don't worry. Um, speaking of that, uh, so that was all, all I've been talking about is the language, but to make all these features happen, they have to be supported in the compiler. And so we've been doing a lot of work on the compiler over the last year. And some of it, especially in the last few months, has been this feature work. But before that, there was a lot of more foundational work and refactoring that was intended to bring some really advanced features that have been in the pipeline for a long time uh, to reality. And so one of them, which I'll go into in a little more detail in a second, is incremental compilation, which means until now, whenever you build a Ross project, it always starts from scratch. And in the beginning, that's okay, because your project is like 10 lines. But as it gets bigger, it can get a little tedious to the point where when you're building the compiler, sometimes you, you know, go out for coffee. Um, and we would like to change that, right? We want it to be just, you make a small change, it's ready for you right away. Uh, and we've been working really hard on instrumenting the compiler to make that happen. But we're also trying to support things like const generics, which means you can have a function that's parameterized over a value, not just the type. So you might say, make a different copy of this function for every value of the v parameter n. You know, so when n is one, I want a copy specialized to that, and when n is two and four and eight, and that can be really useful for high performance cases. Um, and procedural macros, which let you not only use the built-in macro system of Rust, but actually write macros in Rust that the compiler will execute, sort of like plugins. And actually, that's how async await is implemented today. So you may have saw that async await used macro notation and stuff on my other slide. That was using a prototype of the procedural macro system. So the code is written to do the transformation is fairly complex. It's written in Rust, but async await uh, layers on top. So let me talk a bit about incremental compilation. This has been something we've, that's been, in, like non-lexical lifetimes, I would say, a long time planned and coming, but turned out to be quite challenging. Right? So uh, the saga begins, I don't remember when it was, but at least a year, probably two years ago with RFC 1298. This basically laid out a plan for how to do incremental compilation. And then we went ahead and we, we implemented that plan. Uh, we, we made a beta release a little while back. And, you know, it worked pretty well. So if you look, um, these are some graphs. The details aren't that important. You just have to look at these big red lines, basically. The far red, far red line, that's how long it takes from scratch. Always the same. But each of these uh, rows, these are, if I make some change, like I modify a particular method and then I recompile, right? So when it always does everything, it takes the same time. But with incremental mode, you can see we've shaved off a lot of time for each of those the different changes. However, this graph's a little deceiving because what we found was that this, uh, although it was working pretty well when it worked, there were a lot of cases where the system as planned uh, wasn't expressive enough. And we weren't able to get much better than this and we wanted to get significantly better, like we want these bars to be, you know, all the way, look like zero, not look like 25% of the time. Um, and so for that, we started a kind of new design that we've been working on. And we're, it's actually a f maybe a month ago, maybe just a few weeks, I lose track of time, things, things go so fast. But relatively recently, actually started to work now. And we call this red-green, 
Uh, I can go into the details another time if you're interested, come find me, but it enables the compiler to reuse results even when parts of the input have changed if we can see that it's still gonna be, the, the end result will still be the same um, and it lets us do a lot better and so we're looking forward to kind of around the end of the year having a significantly more powerful system here. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Carol. Thank you. Hi everyone, so as Aaron mentioned at the beginning, one of our goals for, for uh, 2017 is to lower the learning curve. <laughs> we did it, yay. Okay, so what we're really working on is a lot of different things, including the ergonomics initiative, and one of the projects that I've been working on a lot is uh, the Rust programming language book uh, with Steve, Steve, wave. There's Steve. Um, so, No Starch is working with us to get this into print, and I, I am sorry to say that the, our date has slipped to be May, uh, so it's a great Mother's Day present, um, <laughs> but it is coming, it will happen someday, believe me, I am excited as you to see this in print. Um, you can read it online and give us feedback, especially on the later chapters uh, at this GitHub link. Uh, another effort we've been working on is uh, having mentoring available at all levels. So the, the working groups in the impl period are, are a huge source of, of mentoring and as Nico said, there's, there's room for everyone here and we will find something for you to do. Um, but we also wanted, we, we want to grow Rust Pi. We want to bring more people into Rust and have people who are New to Rust, uh, new, new to programming, but also new to Rust, or not new to programming, but new to Rust, and people who are experienced at Rust to get involved with the language itself. And um, we especially want to bring in folks who are underrepresented in tech. Women, people of color, LGBTQ folks, people with disabilities, who, and these are folks who also tend to be especially underrepresented in systems programming. I think, and a lot of us think, that uh, Rust is an enabling technology that lets more people participate in systems programming, and we want to grow Rust Pi by bringing in everyone. Another effort we've been doing is uh, the Rust Bridge workshops. This comes out of the, uh, there was Rails Bridge, and there are many other bridge workshops in other languages. Uh, these are targeted towards underrepresented folks in tech. We had one yesterday run by Ashley. Ashley, would you like to wave? Mm. And if anyone who was at that workshop yesterday would like to wave. Yay! Yay. So uh, in this workshop, everyone builds a web app that gives you emergency Rust compliments. Um, <laughs> and and we, hope to, we hope to help people run more of these. Uh, in about January, Ashley and I are probably going to hold a, an online Rustbridge teacher training to help people feel confident about running one of these in your own community. So keep your eye out for that. Um, and the bridge events, to be called a bridge event, you have to be targeted towards underrepresented folks, but the curriculum is online and free to use for anyone. You just can't call it a bridge event if it's not targeted. Um, so this is an example of making thing, when you make things better for underrepresented folks, you're also making it better for everyone. Another effort we've been working on is the Increasing Rust Reach program, um, where we brought in folks that have experiences and insights in other, uh, other fields like teaching and um, other languages that can help us, that are things that we lack experiences we lack in the Rust community and bringing them in to help us make Rust better. And this has been going on. Um, there are a few folks here that are participating in the program. If you would like to wave, you may wave. Um, we're, we're going to be putting out, uh, this is going to be finishing up soon and you should hear more about how those projects went soon. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun and people have been enjoying working on these projects. Uh, another project we've done uh, is the Request for Explanation podcast. 
There have been a lot of RFCs, and they're not always uh, easy to keep up with, easy to read, easy to understand how it will impact you. Um, so Manish in the back, if you would like to wave. Manish has helped with this effort uh, to make little digestible discussions of RFCs to help everyone keep up with how the language is changing. So if you have any RFCs that you'd like us to talk about, uh, let us know at, at our repository, and we'll, we'll get to those and talk about them soon. Another effort that we've been working on is uh, making high-quality libraries available and easy to find. So we've been, in order to do that, we did some um, research into how people decide what crates to use, and we found that uh, the, the most important thing that people look for is good documentation. And I think this is probably something in Hoverbear's workshop yesterday that, that was reinforced, that good documentation is like the first interaction people have with your library. So if you are a library author, I would highly recommend spending some more time on your docs. We could all use better docs. Um, and there are a lot of other things that people look for when they're looking for a crate. And we took these into account and made some improvements to Crates.io this year. We've added categories so that you can be like, I want a crate that does this. And you can go to the, this category and find the crates that do that. Um, we've changed the sorting to be recent downloads within the categories and the keywords. We've added some badges so you can see if the crate is currently passing on various CI things on Windows and on Linux. And you can see all the crates that a particular user or a particular team owns. So you can see which crates uh, work together well. Uh, for example, this is the Rust Lang Nursery Libs team. So you can see all the crates that that team is working on. If you like this team's work, you can see what other things they've made. We've also got a badge on here showing that Bitflags is passing on CI. Um, and we, another improvement that we shipped recently is that we're rendering readmes on the crate page, which is really exciting. So this is, this is what it looks like if you haven't happened to see this lately. Uh, this is a great place to put that example of, of how to get started using a library to see what it's like to use a library before you go ahead and add it to your project and download it. So, this is a great place to put that intro documentation to help people use your crate. Uh, we might be working on a redesign to, in order to, now that we've added all, these extra, all this extra information for people, it's, it's getting a little crowded, so we might be doing a redesign. Yes. Um, and that's all I have about Crateso, and now it's back to Aaron. So let's talk about build systems. Um, one of the most specific goals we had in um, 2017 on our roadmap was to improve the story for build system integration in Rust. And this is particularly important for um, you know, larger companies who have their own uh, take on how they want builds to work. They're often using big build systems like Basil uh, to do all of the building across all of the languages and product, uh, projects um, at the company. And there you know, have been various points of friction integrating Rust into that story. Um, it's like unclear what role cargo should play and how to plug cargo into these kinds of build systems. Um, so we've been putting a lot of thought into how to make this process uh, friction free so that adopting Rust um, in companies large and small is, is a lot easier. Um, so I don't have time to go through all the details, but uh, I think probably the most important insight um, that's come out of this process is trying to understand cargo not as a single monolithic thing, but actually really a bunch of different uh, tools, like a pipeline of tools that work together and when you are working in a pure Rust ecosystem, you generally use the whole tool chain together, um, and you, you don't really care about these distinctions. But when you want to bring Cargo into your build system or customize something that it's doing, uh, being able to sort of peel it apart and replace some of the layers and keep others is really helpful. 
Um, so I'm just gonna walk through real quick what this, this layering is. And if you have build system issues, uh, I would love to talk to you. Um, I'm always looking for, for more use cases. So the, the first thing that Cargo does is dependency resolution. This is probably the single most opinionated aspect of Cargo. Um, where you know, we're baking in the way we think about semantic versioning and so on. And <clears throat> after dependency uh, resolution is complete, you get a lock file, right? This is hopefully familiar to, to many of you if you've used Cargo much. But the, the steps after this, um, you may not have thought about. So once you've got this dependency graph, there are still a, a bunch of steps left to actually do a build. Uh, the first one is actually figuring out for each crate, uh, how do you want to build that crate? What, what kinds of knobs have you tweaked? And these, these knobs are at the sort of cargo tomal um, level of abstraction. So things like profiles or uh, crate features or you know, configuring particular targets, so on and so forth. So this is still at the level of you know, what you as a Rust programmer are, are used to specifying. Um, and you know, there's a step where basically with the, the um, dependency graph, we go and figure out how each crate should be configured on these lines. Then we go crate by crate and turn that high level configuration into a really granular series of build steps, which might involve running Rust-C multiple times if you have you know, a, a build script, for example. It might involve running other binaries. And we have to convert all those configuration settings uh, down to flags to actually pass Rust-C. Um, and then finally, we go and execute those granular steps. Right, so each of these pieces uh, is something that's useful in different settings. And the hope is that, for example, uh, if you're using Basil and you, maybe you don't want dependency resolution or build configuration, but you can use build lowering so that you don't have to fully grok um, the Rust-C command line interface, you can still work at a cargo level of abstraction, just as one example. Um, so I think this is a really interesting area. Um, it's still very much in development. And, and like I said, I, I would love to hear from you if you've encountered friction uh, with cargo in a, in a larger build system setting. So switching gears, um, one of the things we saw um, when we conducted the Rust survey in 2016 that I think surprised a lot of the, uh, you know, the people on the Rust core team was the importance of IDEs. Um, it was probably the single most requested um, piece of tooling and for many people blocker to using Rust effectively. Um, so you know, in, in the last year and a half, uh, we've really put a lot of effort into the IDE story and uh, there are now multiple IDEs that are quite good uh, for working with Rust code. So one of them is IntelliJ, which um, a few months ago, actually uh, the community plugin around IntelliJ for Rust became an officially supported part of the IntelliJ platform. So there are now actually multiple people working full time at IntelliJ on this Rust plugin. Uh, and so th this IDE is really great and it's, it's making uh, a lot of progress. It's also part of the impl period if you want to hack on it. Um, but so the IntelliJ approach is to sort of, uh, they, you know, they support a huge range of languages. They have a lot of infrastructure and they kind of have their own way of doing things. They're not leveraging uh, the Rust compiler itself. Uh, that's not sort of their approach. So the other main track that we've been exploring is something called the Rust language service, um, which speaks a protocol that's used in uh, VS Code um, and several other um, IDEs. It was developed jointly between Microsoft, Red Hat, and some other important stakeholders. Uh, and so basically the RLS hooks the Rust compiler up to this protocol. It sort of teaches the Rust compiler to speak the, the language that these IDEs want to use. And so as a result, uh, we have a VS Code plugin for Rust, which is also making really good strides. Um, it recently became available actually as part of RustUp, so the setup is a lot easier, um, and we expect a 1.0 release fairly soon. Um, and then there are lots of other things, like uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, now that we have this RLS component, there are lots of other consumers of this kind of information that we can explore very easily without having to like, you know, dig into the guts of the compiler. Um, so this is, this is super exciting. Um, 
so now to go back to you know what Carol was talking about with making high quality libraries um, available and easy to find, uh, one of the things the library team has been working on is the available part and the high quality part, right? Complementing Carol's easy to find part. Um, and so we've been doing this through a program called the Libs Blitz. And as the name suggests, the idea is we're going to you know, fairly quickly go through a lot of different libraries. Um, there, there are a lot of great libraries in the open source Rust ecosystem, many of which are not officially in a sort of 1.0 state, but they're morally pretty close. Um, and so our, basically this initiative was to try to push them over the finish line and actually vet them um, according to a set of guidelines. So we, we picked um, 18 libraries uh, to start that were all in the state, like pretty close. These are not really changing that much. Um, we think it's feasible to try to get these to a, a really solid 1.0. Um, and these are also relatively foundational crates that a lot of other crates depend on. Um, and so then we set up a cadence. Every two weeks, we would target another one of these libraries. Uh, and we would go through a public discussion um, during those two weeks where uh, people could talk about their experiences uh, with the library's shortcomings that they saw, questions they had, uh, but then also we have a sort of official um, check, checklist that's generic across all libraries that just sees whether they're following conventions, whether their documentation is good, and so on and so forth. Um, so then uh, at the end of that two week period, the uh, official libs team would meet with the library author and uh, usually some guests and talk about everything that came up in the discussion turn that into a whole bunch of to-do items, tracking issues and so on. Um, and then we would send that out to the amazing Rust community and they would all immediately be picked off. Um, it was, it's been incredible. Um, so we've been making uh, really, really great progress on these libraries um, and you know, I think almost all of them will in fact hit effectively 1.0 status by the end of the year. But that's not all. Um, one of the things I find most exciting about this is we've structured it in a way that by the end of the year, not only do we get all of these libraries to a good place, but we have this byproduct of two books that uh, sort of come out of this process. So the first one is the um, Rust API guidelines, which uh, David Tolney is uh, heading up these days. Um, if you're interested in this, you should definitely talk to him. And so this is, this is the sort of fully elaborated form of our current best practices around Rust APIs, documentation, uh, platform support, all, of, all the things you as a serious library author should be thinking about. Um, so, so this is gonna be a great resource uh, for library authors to come. And then um, something that, that so I'm, I'm personally helping lead right now is the, uh, the Rust cookbook, which basically, if you look at all these libraries we've been going through, part of the process is we, we try to pull out a handful of really compelling copy-pasteable examples. Like what problems does this library solve? And you know, is there an easy way to uh, just copy-paste that into your code to get going, right? Um, I don't know about you, but this is the most common way I first interact with the library is like, I know, oh, I need to do something with regular expressions. Let me find an example that looks about like what I want and copy that in. Uh, so this is gonna be, I think, a really vital res resource for discoverability in the ecosystem, and we've, we've tied it nicely to the Blitz. Um, yeah, so I've already talked about uh, the sort of 1.0 status, but uh, it feels great to have been, been vetting all of these crates, and I think by and large, they're looking really good. As part of the 2017 plan, we also had some specific uh, library goals in particular around the uh, server networking ecosystem, which is one of the places that Rust has gotten the most production use so far. Uh, so, um, in, so at the beginning of 2017, the Tokyo project uh, was publicly launched. This project uh, uh, provides a sort of higher level async IO story for Rust um, using futures as, as Nika was talking about before. Um, and it is being used in, in production today. I think you know, an ecosystem has, has grown up around it. This is the first part of the story we wanted to tell here. Um, but there's, there's a lot to do still. Uh, so one thing we've, 
gotten a lot of feedback on over the course of the year is that uh, Tokyo is difficult to learn. Um, you know, it's doing it's doing a lot of very interesting things, but uh, you know, there's not as, as smooth of an entryway as we'd like. So sort of similar to the themes with the language, we've been working to lower the learning curve and, and give you a simpler entry point. So there's an RFC for that, and uh, Alex uh, Creighton has been uh, doing a lot of great implementation work there. Um, but we, we've got so much more um, in the pipeline. So there's async await, which was mentioned before, and we're building up our HTTP stack. Um, HTTP2 support is on the way. And perhaps most excitingly, uh, there's a company, um, a, a startup you may have heard of uh, called Buoyant, doing um, uh, sort of uh, very sophisticated proxy servers, and they are betting very heavily on Rust. So they're, they're now funding um, like three, I think, full-time people working on the Rust open source stack here. Um, so this is, this is fantastic, and I think uh, you know, we're going to see great things by the end of the year. Okay, so, so one final thing for me um, that's probably closest to my heart is uh, growing Rust's leadership. Uh, I think, you know, for me personally, it, it's, you know, if you go back and look at that slide with the 35 working groups, like getting my head around just how big Rust is and how much leadership that requires, that's been a big lesson of this year. Uh, and so I think we've really, stepped up our mentoring at the highest levels um, where you know, we find people who have been doing great work and uh, create a space for them to take on even more responsibility and to take on leadership roles. So part of that is we have actually added brand new sub-teams or you know, in many cases broken up uh, a team into multiple sub-teams that are more focused. I think we'll be doing more of that um, and overall uh, things have been growing like, like gangbusters. Um, so, so this has been super encouraging and I, I hope we continue in future years. And you know, it is interesting to note that uh, this growth is largely coming outside of Mozilla. And you know, the amount of involvement, of course, for, for each of these people is different, but uh, I think the, the message is that you know, Rust is not owned and operated by Mozilla, it's owned and operated by its community, which is where we want it to be. All right, now to Carol. So ultimately, a lot of this work is to hopefully increase the usage of Rust, because I think that would make software better overall. And I'm happy to say that we are seeing some increases. This is a graph of the uh, production Rust users as shown on the Rust Friends page, which if you, your company is using Rust in production and you would like to be on that page, you can send in a pull request. Uh, this is since we started that page and we're now at about 88 companies. And one of the biggest companies, even though Rust is not Mozilla, Mozilla is a big production user of this, we're gonna be hearing more about the Stylo project from Josh Matthews later today. Uh, but Stylo is the, the Servo style system, Servo is the experimental browser that Mozilla has been making that is all in Rust, and the, the style system has been pulled into Firefox from Servo, and you can try it out on Firefox Nightly and the Firefox developer version and beta, and it's a lot faster, because everything's parallelized and renders really quickly. So this is very exciting, it's going to be uh, shipping in a future version of Firefox in production, so we're re all really excited for that. The number of crates uh, available in the ecosystem has been growing as well. We have over 10,000 crates available. And are these crates being used? Yes, they are. In, in July, we had over 15 million downloads of crates. So, yeah, this is great. We're going up and to the right, Rust is blowing up. This is so awesome. <laughs> let's, let's put these big numbers in a little bit of context here. Uh, you, NPM is uh, Node's package registry, which is like Crates.io, and they have their graph of downloads. And let's see, where, where is that uh, 15 million? Oh, that's... <laughs> Yeah, okay, all right, so we're not in the big leagues yet, but um, 
this, this is actually exciting to me because we here are all still in on the ground floor of Rust. It is growing and we've got a lot of room to grow and room to make Crates.io better before we get to NPM scale. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna get there someday. But uh, so the answer to, to the question of are we there yet is a resounding no, but we can get there with your help. If you're thinking about getting involved, now is a really great time with all the working groups and I, we have a lot of contribution opportunities set up and people ready to help you contribute and we'd love to have you. Please join us, thank you.